Okay, I'm going to um, do a homework problem. Um, I just picked one out. So this one gives you a mole of nickel um, and for a wire with a mass and a density. Um, and so you, so, so you, uh, you, you put a, a mass on the end of it and it stretches. And so, but the point is it says, what's the interatomic spring constant? Okay, so let's just do this generically first. Okay, so here's a wire. Like that. And so this is broken into um, atoms that are they're like a box big, right? Little boxes. Okay. And so this has a, a side of length D, and this is, um, let's say this has a cross section area in the bottom of A and a, and a length of L. Okay, so if I take, if I put some mass on the end of here, um, what was it? In this case, it was 53 kilograms. Then that would be a force of 53 times 9.8 newtons per kilogram that would pull it down. And the whole thing would stretch, it would stretch amount delta L. Okay, so if that were a spring, you know, I know the uh, force from a spring is Ks. So if I know if I know S, which would be delta L in this case, and the force I could find, I can find the spring constant for that wire. But I don't want that. I want the spring constant for the interatomic springs. Okay, so here this is going to be K wire. It's going to be um, I'll call this big M G, that's, that's this mass, divided by delta L, right? That's what that is. That's the, that's the spring constant for the whole thing. Well, if we think of this as a whole bunch of springs in between the atoms, we have some in, par in series, and we have some in parallel. Like that, okay? So, what if they're all the same spring, how can I find the spring constant of those? Well, there's first the thing to think about is if I take a spring and I add another one right here on the end of it in series, then if I stretch it, it's going to stretch twice as long. So that it makes the spring constant effectively um, half as much if there were two of them, right? Yep. Okay, and then if I take two springs we'll call this series. And if I take two in parallel, then when I, when I add a load to the bottom of it, each one only has to stretch half as much in order to support the same load. So it's going to make an effective spring constant that's stronger. Okay. So how can I relate this to the interatomic spring constant? Well, let's see. Um, if I have the spring constant for every one that's in series, it's going to make it weaker, right? So if I had three in series, it would be a third as strong. Yep. So I'm going to write this, that Ks is the interatomic spring constant. This is the number of springs in series. And for every spring in parallel, it makes it stronger. So I have this number of springs in parallel divided by the number of springs in series for this particular thing. So how do I find that? How do I find the number of springs parallel? Well, if I look at this head on, this is a, some area A, and if I know the, um, this is A, if I know the interatomic diameter, D, then um, I can find that. I could say NP is just that total area A divided by D squared, right? Because each one of those squares has a size of D times D, and, and then if I divide A by D times D, that'll give me the number of squares in there, which is the number of springs in parallel. How do you find D? I'm going to leave that as a problem for you. I think you can do that. Because you just need the density and the, the atomic mass. Um, right. And you can find it. 
Okay, so, and then what about in series? Uh, again, if I know the length of this and I know the length of each one of these, I could find it. The number in series is going to be L divided by D. So let me put that in here. This is going to be, um, NP is going to be A K S over D squared. N S is going to be L over D. So one of those cancels. And I get that. A K S over D L. Okay, so now I want to find um, the interatomic spring constant. That's what I wanted to. Is that DL? Or, yeah, that's right, L, not delta L. So let me solve. I have this equal to this. I can solve for KS. KS equals MG over delta L. And then I have DL over A. Okay, so this is D. This is F right? That's F. So let me rewrite this. KS equals F over A and then I have over delta L over L, right? I can remove that, make an improper fraction, D. So this is Young's modulus times D. That is the correct answer, right? No, oh, Young's modulus over D. Wait, KS, why is there D on the bottom? A, made a mistake. Number in parallel is a over d squared. You know, when you make a mistake in a video, you're, it's like, I'm going to have to delete this video and start over, and I don't want to do that. How much time have I used so far? Six minutes. Okay. Let's see. I guess these are backwards. If I have the spring constant, if I want to get the real spring, if that's... I think I must have that backwards. MP is NP is A over D squared, A over D squared. L over D is in S. So if I have a spring constant of 1 and I have 3 in parallel, it would have a spring constant of 3. That's right. Help! What did I do wrong? Okay. So A over D squared, L over D. You know, once you make an error, it's like you're screwed. You're never going to find it. A, L, D, S, K, S, D, K, S. What the hell? Oh, that's Jung's modulus. Okay, no, that's right. I was right the whole damn time. Okay, so uh, that's right. I didn't make a mistake. Okay, so that's right. So now, um, you know, Young's modulus are all things that you can uh, determine um, by by actual macroscopic properties. And but this gets down to the in the book it says y equals k s over d. Duh, it's the same thing. Hello, I feel so dumb now. Okay, so I think that that should help you with those homework problems. Um, you know, you got to think of it making these connections between atomic and uh, macroscopic properties.